On June 18th, 2018, 20-year-old rapper XXXTentacion, birth name Jose Onfroy, was shopping for motorcycles in South Florida. As he was leaving the motorcycle dealer, his BMW was cut off by an SUV, and two gunmen quickly jumped out and opened fire, before stealing a Louis Vuitton bag filled with $50,000 cash. Although it looked like a very simple case of armed robbery and murder, a sinister theory involving one of the biggest artists of the last few decades began to surface. Way back in the beginning of 2017, Drake previewed a snippet of his new song, KMT, and as soon as the preview dropped, people started comparing the song to X's hit song, Look At Me. Drake said that after the fact, he was shown X's song and could see how people could draw a comparison, but that he had not in fact ever heard of X before, which X had something to say about. Soon after, during a live interview on 103.5 The Beat, X didn't mince words, saying that not only did he know Drake knew of him and had heard his music, he knew this because Drake's producer had made contact with X's management in hopes of setting up a collab, a detail that was corroborated by Adam22 on his podcast, No Jumper. X was unable to respond because he was in jail at the time, and shortly after they received the offer, Drake had previewed a song that many felt he ripped from X. In addition to this call-out during the radio interview, X ranted on Twitter about not only his song being bit, but Drake ripping off multiple other artists as well. X then went live on IG, making sexual comments about Drake's mom, and speaking more about the beef. On February 24th, 2018, X posted this on his IG, saying, If anyone tries to kill me, it was Champagne Poppy, Drake's IG handle. I'm snitching right now. A while after X's death in June of 2018, Eagle-eyed fans started finding clues in Drake's lyrics, seemingly alluding to his hand in the young rapper's death. On January 6, 2019, Drake released his song Mob Ties, which contains the lyric, Louis bags in exchange for body bags, which seems like a jab at the fact that X was killed while being robbed for his Louis bag. The song also contains lyrics about hiring help to take care of people, which is what some X fans think happened in this situation. In one of Drake's more recent songs, he says, Maybe I should do a 20. Maybe I should break that 20, do a 10. Maybe I should break that 10, do a 5. Then if it gets live, do a 5 again. 10, 10, 10, or Roman numerals XXX, followed directly by the line, if he held his tongue on that live, he'd be alive again. Allegedly, referring to the IG live that escalated the whole situation. Just in the last couple months, the actual trigger men that took X's life were on trial, and their defense team tried hard to have Drake brought in and deposed about any role he may have played. The reason that she wanted security with Mr. Onfroy on the day that he was shot was because of the issues that he had with Drake and Migos. She's gonna tell you that, okay? Now, what issues does she have? There's, there's, a, there's issues where Migos was attacked by him, but the important thing is that the mom is gonna tell you that that's why I wanted that security with him, okay? So, do you think anybody's ever talked to them? No. And that's unacceptable. However, the judge refused to drag Drake into the case. So, do you think Drake had anything to do with X's untimely death? When the Dr. Phil show began, on-again, off-again clinical psychologist Phil McGraw offered advice in the form of self-help and life strategies. Although I can't say whether or not he's done it intentionally, the show has moved far from the realm of self-help into what many now see as pure exploitation of mental illness, addiction, and many other painful, emotional problems and issues of the less fortunate. The show still retains a large viewership every day, so it's not going away anytime soon. I bring this up for a specific reason. One that as I researched for this video, kept revealing more and more disturbing details. A rabbit hole of fraud, abuse, and even death. Strangely enough, it all began with Danielle Bregoli. Huh? Catch me outside, how about that? Catch you outside? What does that mean? now known as Bad Baby. Almost exactly two years ago, Bregoli posted a video about what went on at Turnabout Ranch, the troubled teen treatment program Dr. Phil sent her to. The video was titled Breaking Code Silence, which refers to a group of activists and survivors of abuse suffered at the hands of the troubled teen industry. Bregoli describes the ranch as more of a psychotic work camp where teens are broken in during their initial days on site using deprivation torture. What initially sparked Bad Baby into coming 
forward about her experience was hearing about Hannah Archuleta's experience, her former classmate that had also done time on the ranch. Hannah appeared on a 2019 episode of Dr. Phil, after which she was transported directly from the backstage area of Dr. Phil's studio in Hollywood straight to Turnabout Ranch in Escalante, Utah. Approximately two weeks after her arrival, one of the staff members at the ranch began sexually assaulting Hannah. After the second incident of abuse, Hannah approached a female counselor who she trusted and told her what had been happening. The response? Zero consequences for the male staff member that had been assaulting Hannah. But for Hannah, things became much harder. Her work duties were doubled, leading to outright exhaustion and her bed was removed, leaving her to sleep on a wooden plank. In December of 2016, after struggling with drug dependence and behavioral issues, Clay Brewer was sent to Turnabout Ranch. Five days later, he beat staff member Jimmy Wolseley to death and hit another staff member until she gave up her car keys. Caleb then stealing the car and fleeing until captured by authorities after a high-speed chase. Clay pled guilty to all charges, commenting that he had lost his mind while coming off drugs at the camp, which of course is horrible. It's murder. But I see it as another example of how terribly wrong it can go when you put a still-developing teenager in a high-stress situation in a strange place where tough love seems to be the only real idea, especially when the kid is coming off of drugs. These kids need therapy, and that should be the focus, along with the hard work and teaching them how to be disciplined in their everyday life, not just disciplining them, which is exactly how Dr. Phil presents these programs to the parents. Dr. Phil presents the programs as treatment centers, where the teens will receive therapy and be taught how to self-actualize and provided tools to help them self-regulate their emotions and responses to negative stimuli, which is extremely ironic since in many of these cases, the kids he sends to these camps are literally kidnapped in the middle of the night, forced into vans, and taken to these facilities against their will. Listen, listen, you don't have a choice about knowing. We have to explain this to you. No, If you need something, ask us and we'll get it for you. No, I want you to leave. Nobody's leaving. You're in our custody from this point forward. It's 3 a.m. We're going to be going to do our intervention with Madison in a few moments. Hopefully she doesn't give us too many problems. So here, take your doctor to phone, honey. I love Morning, you. Madison. Madison. My mom and I already agreed that that's not happening. Your mom just came in here and told you she changed the plan. Go Madison. out of my room. Stop trying to touch me. Don't. No, don't. no I, if I want to get out of my bed, let me get out of my bed. I don't hear you. I don't care if the parents sign off on it, this is kidnapping and is going to be a whole new level of trauma and distrust between the kid and their parents. And the cherry on top is Dr. Phil sends a camera crew out and then airs the footage. The footage is then clipped and used in commercials advertising the shows. How is this practice not a direct method of retaining viewership, profiting off of an extremely traumatic moment in an already troubled teen life? So, in response to the growing media attention to rumors of abuse scandals, Dr. Phil held a softball interview to address the scandal. Um, she says that the place that she was recommended to go was uh, abusive to her, wouldn't let her sleep. What are your what are your re uh, responses to her? Well, you know, she went to um, turn about four or five years ago, and if she had a bad experience, you know, obviously I would I would hate that. We'd be sorry about that, but uh, we don't have anything to do uh, with what happens with guests once they leave the stage. I mean, that's between the guardian and the parent and whatever facility they go to. So we're not involved in that. We don't have any feedback from them. So it, whatever happens once they're there, uh, that's between them and the, and the facility. I assume she had a problem. She filed a complaint with the proper authorities or something five years ago. So I, I really don't know much about it. So that there's the look. When we were kids, uh, we got the strap, we got the brush. Uh, if you were at school, you might have had to put your hands out and you'd get the ruler. But there was some amount of pain that came along with with bad uh, behavior. And I know that the spanking debate has been well worn out long ago. But now we're dealing with a generation of kids who tell teachers to f off. And and I'm just wondering, like, have we made a mistake? As you can see, he apologized if Bregoli had a bad time as the interviewer basically says the kids are soft because people her and Dr. Phil's age were beaten as children. With all the backlash, I doubt Dr. Phil will be sending anyone back to Turnabout specifically, but it's not one of a kind. The troubled teen industry is full of unethical, untrained grifters, at best just looking to make a buck, at worst 
placing themselves in a position to abuse children indiscriminately. On July 14th, 2020, model, producer, actress Chrissy Teigen tweeted, I have blocked over 1 million people, 1 million people today, and I am still flooded with six psychopaths. So please, spare me the, just ignore them, they're trolls. Why? What was going on that she had to take such a scorched earth approach to these quote unquote trolls? Well, what Tegan failed to mention in this tweet is that on the same day, she also deleted over 60,000 tweets. It was the content of these deleted tweets that had many people questioning if the rumors about Chrissy Teigen and her husband John Legend allegedly having close ties to deceased child trafficker Jeffrey Epstein could be true. Here are some of those tweets. I'm going to Anthony Weiner this kid. To understand how depraved and relevant this specific tweet is, we'll take a quick trip down Weiner Lane. Anthony Weiner's in a familiar position, apologizing again for inappropriate behavior. There is no question that what I did was wrong. This behavior is behind me. I've apologized to my wife, Huma. In 2011, Anthony was serving in his sixth term as a New York congressman, was quite powerful, rich, and well-liked, even appearing on The Daily Show and The Bill Maher Show. On May 27, 2011, Anthony posted a picture publicly of his junk, thankfully covered up by his underwear, but the man posted a stiffy pic as a married congressman. Now's a good time to bring up the fact that his wife was at the time Hillary Clinton's right-hand woman. So not only is he a powerful government official, but his wife, Huma Abedin, was probably even more important and powerful, so this dick pic was a bad move. Even more embarrassing was his explanation. Wiener had accidentally posted the picture instead of DMing it to what he described as a college-aged female. But on June 10th, 2011, it came out that at least one of the females he was texting inappropriately was a 17-year-old girl in Delaware. It was after this that he publicly stated he would be taking a leave of absence, but he was basically let go after a large amount of media pressure and backlash from his colleagues. Today I am announcing my resignation from Congress. So my colleagues can get back to work, my neighbors can choose a new representative, and most importantly, that my wife and I can continue to heal from the damage I have caused. On June 21st, 2011, Wiener officially resigned, but interestingly, was allowed to keep his $4 million campaign account, and the investigation opened by the House Ethics Committee was quickly and quietly closed, with apparently no additional consequences. In 2013, he ran for mayor of New York City and was crushed, and in 2016, things started to get real sketchy for the Wiener man once again. There were multiple leaks of cringy flirt texts with of-age women while he was still married, but on August 29th, Anthony deleted his Twitter, sparking rumors that something darker was going on. On September 22nd, 2016, the Daily Mail leaked many sexually explicit messages between the former congressman and a 15-year-old girl. Anthony Weiner in more trouble for him. Child Services is now investigating the former congressman after his latest round of sexting, which included a photo showing his young son in the background. ABC's Mars Gavacampo is here with the latest. York City's Administration for Children's Services is investigating Anthony Weiner and his care for his four-year-old son, Jared, after this photo became public. The lewd image sent to one of Weiner's alleged sexting partners and also showing the former congressman's son. Which was quickly followed up by a federal subpoena for records including his phone and laptop. The NYPD obtained the laptop and apparently were so disgusted and appalled by the contents within the laptop that hardened NYPD NYPD veterans were crying and vomiting. The NYPD chief at the time said, what's in the emails is staggering, and as a father, it turned my stomach. That NYPD chief was found dead, apparently by a self-inflicted gunshot wound, one month before his retirement and pension payout. Overall, 12 NYPD officers viewed the contents of the laptop. Nine of them are now dead. On May 19th, 2017, Anthony Weiner pled guilty to transferring obscene material to a minor. Weiner served 18 months of his 21-month sentence. So when Chris Chrissy Teigen says, I'm gonna Anthony Weiner this kid. It literally can only mean one thing. 
This wasn't Tegan's only scandal involving Twitter. She also faced a backlash for allegedly bullying a young girl. Conveniently, for anyone interested in researching why Chrissy Teigen deleted over 60,000 tweets and blocked over 1 million accounts, that story has now been buried under a less career-threatening and less disturbing scandal, a technique or coincidence I see all too often when researching these stories. In a disturbing and strange coincidence, while researching this segment, I came across an article from 2014 titled, John Legend and Chrissy Teigen Feed Protesters in New York City. And as I read the article, I came across the name Charles Wade, the man that helped coordinate the event for Teigen. Chasing the rabbit down its endless, ever-spiraling hole, I searched his name. Charles Wade, arrested for prostitution and sex trafficking. In 1963, the Beatles were exploding in England. Their debut album, Please Please Me, came out in March, followed by their mega-hit single, She Loves You, in August, then dropping their second album, and hit single, I Wanna Hold Your Hand, coming out just a few months later, setting them up for their historic run, soon becoming one of, if not the biggest band of all time. But there's a theory that one of the Beatles' founding members, Paul McCartney, may not have been along for most of that journey. And this theory isn't just from some internet forum, it's from a book called the Memoirs of Billy Shears, authored by Thomas E. U. Harriet, with Billy Shears as a contributor, but there are also versions of the book with Paul McCartney's name included and signed as co-author. The theory is that on November 9, 1966, Paul passed away in a car accident and was replaced by a man named Billy Shears. Due to the Beatles being one of the top-earning artists in the world, their manager, Brian Epstein, panicked but quickly hatched a plan. According to the theory, he held a look-alike contest, a contest that a man named Billy Shears won. But Billy didn't just look like Paul. Billy was a lifelong musician who could play trumpet, piano, banjo, and dozens of other instruments. Billy had even made records of his own where he would play cover songs and impersonate Paul's voice perfectly. Apparently, Billy could play the role well enough for records and press, but there was one thing a little plastic surgery couldn't fix. All the members of the Beatles stood about 5'10", but Billy was much taller, at about 6'4", the theory claiming that this is why the Beatles never toured after the summer of 1966. Another interesting detail, during one tour in the United States, Paul allegedly got a few female fans pregnant and faced several lawsuits for child support, finally needing to appear in court to handle one of these cases. After the replacement is theorized to have taken place. Paul walked into the courtroom, only for the plaintiff, a mother who claimed her child was Paul McCartney's son, exclaimed, who the hell are you, when she saw Paul or now, Billy. According to the theory, major differences can be seen in the physical appearances between the old Paul and the new Paul, most notably in the height, chin, nose, and hair weave. The original Paul was very slight in build, but Billy was not only taller, but more broad. In 2002, Paul, or Billy, married a woman named Heather Mills. In 2002, they were married, and in 2006, they embarked on a highly publicized separation and divorce. It was in 2007 that Heather started hinting that her discovery of a terrible secret was the reason behind the divorce. Heather's Access Hollywood revelations on the 1st of November 2007 seemed very telling. You know why I've you protect me and I will say nothing. Something so awful happened. Um, someone I'd loved for a long time I found out had betrayed me immensely and I don't mean infidelity or anything like that. Like beyond belief. Somebody betrayed you and, and of course everyone here is going to believe that that's Paul McCartney in a way not infidelity that is so much deeper than that. It wounded you and pushed you towards suicide. Yeah, it did. And he knows that. So it's Paul. But I, I've got to protect myself. I have to protect myself. People don't want to know what the truth is because they could never, ever handle it. They would be too devastated. Billy Bush went on to ask, Knowing what you now know about Paul, would you have married him in the first place? Heather replied firmly and simply, never. Heather Mills' interview, aka Meltdown, with Fiona Phillips on British news and entertainment show GMTV is probably her most infamous. It took place a day prior to the Access Hollywood interview and featured tears, melodrama, and a good deal of ranting and raving. But again, Heather stated that she was harboring a terrible secret for Paul, a secret that had brought her to the brink, a secret she was legally bound to keep quiet about. She said, I have protected my husband. I know everything. 
I know the truth. Particularly intriguing and sinister is Heather's suggestion that she had been threatened into silence by the architects of a grand conspiracy. I have a box of evidence that is going to a certain person should anything happen to me. So if you top me off, it's still going to go to that certain person and the truth will come out. There is such a fear from a certain party of the truth coming out. Some other cryptic clues about Paul McCartney's possible replacement. The Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band album cover is said to be full of clues. Most notably, the entire crowd seems to be gathered around a grave, which shows yellow flowers in the shape of a bass guitar, Paul's instrument. In their song, A Day in the Life, the lyrics speak about a man who blew his mind out in a car because he didn't even notice the red lights had changed. Even more suspiciously, a crowd of people stood and stared because they'd seen his face before. Along with newspaper reports from the earlier accident with Paul's car, this led fans to believe that he'd been killed in a car crash. Also, when you put a mirror in the center of the drum, the words read, I won, I X, he die. The I won is sent to mean 11. The IX is the Roman numeral for 9. It could mean 11-9, he died. Fans took this to mean that Paul McCartney died on November 9th, the same day he was in a car crash. Finally, in the title track on Sgt. Pepper's, the Beatles sing the iconic line, I don't really want to stop the show, but I thought you might like to know that the singer's gonna sing a song, and he wants you all to sing along, so let me introduce you to the one and only Billy Shears. In November of 2022, child star and pop singer Aaron Carter was found dead in a bathtub in his home in LA. The initial call to 911 mentioning that Carter had drowned in his bathtub. He had no wounds or trauma, and his death was quickly ruled as an accidental drug overdose, leading to drowning. However, his mother Jane and his longtime on again, off again fiance Melanie believe something more sinister took place. The coroner's report said that there was no water in his lungs, which pretty much rules out drowning. Jane, Aaron's mom, posted photos of the crime scene in the bathroom along with this statement. They allowed everyone to tromp through the scene, what should have been at least an investigation. Because of my son's mental illness and prescription drug issues, they just wanted something easy that they didn't have the time or inclination to address. Aaron had a lot of death threats and many, many people who were making his life miserable. Forensic death investigator Joseph Scott Morgan points out that there has still been no toxicology report released, which should preclude the cause of death being reported as an overdose. I get it. Aaron was erratic and obviously seemed like he was struggling with substance abuse. But something I find extremely interesting is that one day before his untimely death, Aaron tweeted at Ye West, Yo, Kanye, let's talk, man to man. Also, on November 3rd, Ye, who was embroiled in yet another controversy, tweeted out screenshots of texts he had received from one Harley Pasternak, specifically threatening to drug Kanye, have him institutionalized, sent back to what he refers to as zombie land forever, even bringing Ye's kids into the matter. A fitness and nutrition specialist with a clientele list brimming with A-list celebrity talent. From Will Ferrell to John Mayer and Rihanna, Robert Pattinson, Kim Kardashian, Lady Gaga, Ariana Grande, and on and on. For a personal trainer, the guy is majorly connected in Hollywood, even landing a cameo role in one of the Ninja Turtles movies. But Pasternak has another specialty, one that's conveniently omitted from his website. I was working on my PhD on exercise physiology and nutrition got recruited by the military to uh, help run essentially the superhuman lab, this, this laboratory uh, called the Defense and Civil Institute of Environmental Medicine. The idea of, that I was interested in was how drugs and food affect muscular performance. And well, when you say drugs, were that like performance enhancing drugs? Or they all all just, kinds of drugs. Oh, right, okay. So working for the military, I wasn't governed by the same laws that the typical person was, so I could look at the impact of certain drugs that are not that are not everyday things. Harley was a former scientist at the Defense Research and Development Military Station in Canada, or DRDC, which is part of Canada's Department of National Defense Program. The DRDC researches human systems integration, human performance in stressful environments, simulation and modeling of the human in complex military systems, human issues in command and control, social and psychological factors that affect the resolution of conflict, psychology of malicious intent, and social and cultural factors in 
influencing behavior. This shadowy branch of the Canadian military once included the Defense Research Board, a department that quite literally funded MKUltra with the CIA. If you're unaware of what MKUltra was, or that it was real, it was a top-secret military program that experimented with trauma-based mind control, sensory deprivation, torture, brainwashing, and drugs, including psychotropics and hallucinogens. And though the name of the departments have changed and MKUltra has been partially declassified, it seems as though the associated groups are not only still experimenting, but utilizing what they gathered during MKUltra. Within one day of the tweet exposing Pasternak's messages, two items were removed from his Wikipedia entry, all references to Kanye West, and the list of his former clients, which include Brittany Murphy, who along with her husband died of mysterious illnesses, most likely spurred on by some kind of strange drug-related poisonings, and Mac Miller, who also died of an overdose. Of Brittany Murphy, Pasternak said she seemed high the last time he saw her, and of Mac Miller, he said Mac would be, quote, pissed he died, end quote. The most unsettling detail about this exchange between Ye and Harley is this. On November 17, 2016, during the kickoff for the second leg of his St. Pablo tour, Ye decided to get some political thoughts off his chest. He I told y'all I didn't vote, right? But I didn't tell you. I guess I told you. But if I would have voted, I would have voted on Trump. It's a new world, Hillary Clayton. It's a new world, Barack. It's a new world said on stage that he had not voted, but if he had, he would have voted for Donald Trump, before then doubling down on his claim that he would be running for president in 2020. Three days later, he heavily criticized Beyonce, Jay-Z, and Hillary Clinton. The next day, he was invited to visit his personal trainer, Harley Pasternak's house, in California. Within a couple hours, Kanye was being wheeled into an ambulance, handcuffed to a gurney against his will. Yeah, I'm, just I'm actually uh, one of his doctors. I'm just calling for my cell phone request that we can have some police backup because uh, I don't think the paramedics, you know, are you, not, uh, are you are you there now with them? Let me if you can, if with you the can bring both, I, 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 yeah, because yeah, I think he definitely is going to need to be hospitalized. So I wouldn't just do the police by itself. I think he needs to. Okay, what is the medical? Yeah, what is the medical condition he's having, sir? That voice you hear is, or was, Kanye's personal doctor, Dr. Farazam, who you can hear call for not only paramedics, but also police backup to have Kanye picked up from Pasternak's house. Dr. Farazam and Harley Pasternak wanted to place Kanye in a 5150 temporary hold. 5150 is the number of the section of the Welfare and Institutions Code, which allows an adult who is experiencing a mental health crisis to be involuntary detained for a 72-hour psychiatric hospital hospitalization when evaluated to be a danger to others or to himself or herself or gravely disabled. Ye was transported and admitted to Resnick Neuropsychiatric Hospital at UCLA against his will, where he continued to resist treatment. That night, the paparazzi caught up with Pasternak in his neighborhood. Ye was in that psych ward for over a week, and interestingly, when he was released, the news reports said he had been released after his voluntary admittance. After he was released, Ye's only public appearance was in the lobby of Trump Tower on December 13th, 2016, side by side with the former president after a meeting that Ye described as covering several important issues. After that, Kanye laid low for almost an entire year, his next performance not taking place until about a year later in November of 2017. After his hospitalization, and subsequent visits to Trump Tower, fans and online commentators made references between Kanye and the 2017 smash hit Get Out go completely viral. Now, sink into the floor. Wait, 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 wait. Sink. Implying that Kanye was the one in the sunken place, as though he could only make statements in support of the president-elect against Hillary Clinton and against JC and Beyonce if he had been hypnotized, traumatized, and brainwashed. Although in my opinion, it would seem as though whatever happened during his short visit to Pasternak's home and the resulting week-long stay against his will in a psych ward could have been what actually led him into the sunken place. In February of 2017, a complex article noted Malik Youssef, one of Kanye's long-term friends, had visited West 
West at his house and sat with him for six or seven hours. According to Yusuf, Kanye had major memory issues that were just beginning to clear up, that he was still healing and trying to recover. This coming three full months after a week-long stay at a mental institution, what could he be recovering from? In his May 2018 appearance on The Breakfast Club, Ye said, The moment when you're in a hospital bed and you're next to your friend and you tell them, don't let this person leave my side, and they, and they put you inside of an elevator and take all your friends away from you, that was the scariest moment of my life. I thought I was going to get killed. My wife wasn't in town, so I told them, my friends, don't leave my side until my wife gets here. And they have this moment where they're forced to leave your side, and that has to change. I can't express to you how traumatizing that moment is. And then you wake up, drug the fuck out, adding that he had been exhausted from touring, but that manipulation and being a pawn in a chess game had led to his quote-unquote breakdown. Whatever happened to Ye at that LA home on November 21st, 2016, many have pointed out that Harley Pasternak seems to be the most clear-cut example of a handler to ever surface in the public eye. Is it possible that Kanye's handlers have reset and controlled him using experimental drugs that Pasternak researched during his time with the DRDC? Whatever the truth is, I believe the text from Pasternak that Ye posted give a brief look into the dark side of being a world-famous celebrity. One of the more ridiculous but very interesting theories about the King of Pop, Michael Jackson, is that the face that we all know and remember was nothing more than a mask, and that this is closer to what he actually looked like. The theory started when a man known as Dave Dave appeared on Larry King to give an interview after Jackson's death. You at the time. I was about seven years old at the time. And were you in the hospital? I was not in the hospital at the time. I was, I was in interim back and forth from surgery. With viewers finding an unsettling likeness in the cadence, voice, and speech patterns between Michael and Dave. The theory being that Michael was still alive and that this is closer to what he had looked like since the 80s. But how could this make any sense? On January 27th, 1984, Michael Jackson filmed a Pepsi commercial at LA's Shrine Auditorium. During the sixth take, the pyrotechnics malfunctioned, causing Michael's head to be engulfed in a fireball on camera in front of 3,000 fans. Michael likely couldn't feel it at first, but as he made his way down the stairs, it became clear to the stagehands that his hair was on fire. Karen Fay, Jackson's hair and makeup artist, said, This was someone I knew, and he was on fire. By the time she saw him, all of his hair was gone, and there was smoke coming out of his head. Jackson suffered second and third degree burns on his head and face. Music video director Rudy Dolezal alleged that when he was filming The Dangerous Tour in Munich in 1992, he was told Jackson refused to appear on camera if he wasn't performing because on those days he didn't have a nose he needed a plastic nose that took hours to put on with putty and makeup he told the New York Post by 2002 rumors were rife that Jackson's real nose had completely collapsed forcing him to wear a prosthetic now even stranger there's behind-the-scenes footage of Michael Jackson dressing as an old man for one of his music videos showing a full convincing transformation and he was like, yo, man, I got to take you to this theater, this new technology they got, it's like 4D, like, it feels like, you know, the images are right in front of you, like you're actually in the midst of it. And I was like, nah, I know 3D. He's like, no, listen, you got to check this out. I said, well, let's go. And he paused for a minute. He's like, okay, let's do it tomorrow. <laughs> man, I'm saying to myself, okay, I don't know how we expect to go to the movies, but <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, this is Michael Jack. Like, how the hell are we going to actually go to the movies? So the next day, you know, he calls my room. We was both standing at the Palm in, in Vegas. He's like, you ready? I'm ready. I was like, yeah, let me get dressed. But at the time, I thought he was just joking. I didn't think he was really, I thought he was going to probably just rent, you know, we go through the back late, late night or something. This is broad daylight. So he got, the, he grabbed the kids. They looking normal. Mike comes out. He has his disguise on, you know. So I start laughing. <laughs> because I didn't, I didn't even recognize him, you know. And apparently, this was not a practice that was reserved for entertainment. Due to Michael's superstardom, it was common for him to wear full prosthetic disguises just to go out in public. Dave Dave was a child when he was horrifically burned. Michael donated to and apparently mentored Dave Dave through his childhood. But people have pointed out the differences in pictures of Dave Dave and his appearance on television, insinuating that Michael Jackson didn't pass away on June 25th, 2009, but instead lived on under various assumed identities. 
identities, easily fooling his worldwide fan base, as his most well-known look was nothing more than a mask. Just listen to Dave Dave's voice in comparison to Michael's. You, our world has come to an interesting point in an interesting time. This is a very interesting project we're working on. I want to thank each and every one of you for your overwhelming support. May God bless you. I love you. Good night. Thank you very much for all of your support. And may God bless you all. I love you. Goodbye. Encino House. I think I was in, at the Encino House. To his Encino House. I think I was in, at the Encino House. Encino House. The Encino House. Encino House. The Encino House. I do think Michael's actual appearance could have been much different than what the public saw, but I think the realistic explanation for Dave Dave's similar speech patterns is that he was majorly influenced by Michael at a young age, and most probably unintentionally or intentionally adopted his cadence and tone of voice. So, could Michael still be among us? Using the fact that no one knew what he actually looked like, added to his knowledge and experience with disguise and prosthetics, but why would he want to do that? Well, on top of all the scandals and accusations regarding regarding pedophilia. There is another theory about Jackson, that he was murdered by powerful record executives. See, Michael wasn't just a singer-songwriter, he was also a massive collector of musical copyrights. Michael owned his own music, and rights to many other artists' catalogs, including all of Eminem's music at the time, and all of the Beatles' music. This gave him a massive amount of wealth and power in the industry, an industry he had been critical of in his later years, especially of Sony Music, the company that merged with Jackson's company. Company, ATV Music. If Jackson were to meet an unfortunate end, Sony stood to gain upwards of $750 million. So, could this be why Jackson may have faked his death, or more realistically, why he was killed? We do know that it wasn't a blameless accident as the doctor who administered the lethal dose of propofol to Jackson ended up being convicted of involuntary manslaughter for which he served two years in prison. Home is full of lots of things that children shouldn't touch. Home is full of bad things that can hurt you very much. Now there's a...